people standing like here on the ground here's the toilet here's somebody staying upright on top somebody's staying even higher and they dropping like with this uh, that's what he said like something and you're like what the fuck is happening here what, what, what is it i don't even get it you know but you see like eight people towering up in the toilet and you're like what the fuck is, it? is this like a sex act or something hi everyone and welcome to another reaction video on this channel uh today's video is going to be about three ugly truths about partying in berlin berghain confidential i think we didn't talk about berghain uh enough in the last few videos so we got to bring this uh, theme back <laughs> it's never ending theme and i think since we're investigating on the techno culture or the culture of electronic music i think that's a that's a that's a nice thing nice thing to start so we have this video here from linus ignatius uh, i already liked it so if you want to see it you can watch it here let's l i mean you heard already some uh, ugly truth i think if you like watched like the f uh, all the episodes of my reaction videos then there's like a glimpse of all the you know the ugliness that is behind the scenes but let's listen let's hear it from a from a third party not something who not somebody who is that biased as me let's just start yeah right cut in line and be like this is my stall i remember this is okay People who thought they were cool would sort of cut in line and be like, this is my stall. I remember there's this one guy who was like a dealer and he was a sort of ballet dancer and he would like, when a door, when a bathroom door would open, he'd throw his leg up and block anybody else from going in with a leg like up above people's heads and be like, it's mine, bitch. What's up, YouTube? <laughs> That's a nice story. You know what I imagine? Like this ballet guy who is a drug dealer, you know, power... Puff girls, uh, villain. Yeah, yeah. This is what this is what I thought about. To be honest, who is this? Is this JoJo or is it, uh, him? Oh, okay, it's just him. <laughs> it's just him blocking the door of the toilet to sell drugs <laughs> with his legs. Oh my god, so funny. Could be him. So, uh, Linus Ignatius, if you see this video, can you tell me if he looked like this? Probably did. You want to know about my life as a club kid in Berlin, going to Berghain every weekend, going to the techno parties. Disclaimer, I am seven years sober almost, and I in no way condone or glorify drug use, and that's not what I'm interested in doing in this video. What I am interested in doing is shedding a little light on the underground scene. Three things you might not know. So first of all, respect on seven years soberness. That's uh, something pretty... A thing that you can admire in this city. Nobody, nobody, I know only a few people that are like sober. If you're talking about real soberness, this means no alcohol or marijuana as well. Then, uh, shout out. That's crazy. Especially if you like been partying like every week. I think the, the addiction, uh, the level of addiction is pretty high at this point, I think. About what it was like for somebody like me living in that kind of scene. So the first thing is ego. It was incredibly important to me and my identity that I was able to get into Berghain. And I knew how to get into Berghain and I always got in except for two times. And I said every weekend there and I had all these people. What did he wrote here? Why are you doing this to me, motherfucker? And there and I No! I was able to get into Berghain and I knew how to get into Berghain and I always got in except for two times. I'm not your... Huh? And anyway, I spent every weekend there and I had all these people that I knew inside and like it was so important that I maintained that identity. I go to Berghain and I get in without the, without waiting into the line. You know, I'm I'm permanent guest list, which like I don't even know if that's a thing, but people would like skip the line and sometimes if you dress in this fabulous outfit. That's true. A lot of people are identifying only by getting in there and they won't talk if they get rejected because everybody's getting rejected at one time. You know, they're even the kind of regulars i think i know about it because i have a few friends like this or a few i won't say friends but a few people that i know that are have like this permanent guest list what he's talking about this is, just means you know the bouncer you just go up front and he just lets you in this is a thing that is there feels super unfair and Berkheim has like i would say like a socialist background or yeah like a socialist background i would say you know and this is the most unsocialist thing that I've ever seen. Maybe it is true socialism, because at the end of the day, all these uh, political systems ended up by uh, segregating the 
the equals and the one that are more equal so yeah this is how, how it goes and people cutting line is uh, a constant thing i once uh, said in the video that in Sisyphus you can cut the line when you go to the toilets and you know cut it but i'm i'm actually not a huge fan of cutting the line i think it's pretty I don't know, I think it's not what it's about and I think there you can see the ugly core of uh, of this happening, you know. You're talking about peace, love and harmony and in the party it is peace, love and harmony but outside it's like uh, I need to get in first to consume my first uh, bananas, my first drugs. That you can kind of just skip the line and they treat you like royalty. But... True. That's what he exactly said what I, what I just said. It's funny. I also remember that some of my friends who would go every weekend and they were like super well known in the scene and they were regulars, sometimes the guards would, the, the, the bouncers would reject them once in a blue moon just to cut them down to size, you know, just to take them down a peg and just. That's what I said. Everybody is not getting in at one time, you know, so the no is really present doesn't even matter it's just like if he if he's uh, if he feels like uh, the, if the bouncer feels like his dick is not on the right place he just said fuck off you know to anybody and everybody who says you he, he got in every time he was there is just lying that is just to keep this like mystique around the door door selection process they'd say leider nicht nicht heute nicht you know sorry not tonight you know next time maybe you need a break they, the guards even said you need a break you're banned for a few weeks get yourself together because they would see them like all oh, you know, high and messy or something like that. This is also the thing. True. But isn't that like a good thing to be honest? If you see like a regular who's coming there and leaving the club like this all the time, just say, bro or girl, not today. You <laughs> get to rehab. So there was this like ego relationship with the guards where, you know, the guards by letting people in would kind of grant them this like this cultural clout. You know, I got into bad kind. I know how to get in, and um, and and people really wielded that and weaponized that. You know, uh, and there was a big culture of like, oh, do you know somebody who works there who can get you in off the list? So you don't have to deal with that situation of whether you're selected or not. The next thing is that I was terrified. I was terrified of the door selection process. There was so much fear in my life. Every time I walked up to that thing, which you know, the the metal gate. Every time I walked up to it, I would shake. I would start shaking and I would tell myself, play it cool, play it cool, play it cool. I remember I was like, I don't believe in God, but I'm praying because I'm so scared right now. And I was scared of them telling me that I wasn't cool enough, that I didn't belong, you know? Yeah, wow. So I wouldn't say that I'm fearful of that moment, but it's definitely an intimidating situation. And they really like build it there. I think he's talking about backhand all the time, so I, I will just go ahead and talk about backhand as well. It's like that uh, there is like this huge fear mongering there, and you feel it, you know. I wouldn't say that I'm super fearful or something, but it like really uh, raises your excitement. I would say I, I'm more like excited. And for me, it's like when I don't get in, like my, my philosophy about it, if I'm not going in, uh, then less harm to my health. To my physical health, let's say. Then my mental health, uh, then my mental health is okay, whatever. But like uh, less damage to my physical health. That's what I think. So that's why at the end of the day, I don't care if they let me in or not. Uh, not, but usually, yeah, works out. But if it's not, it's also fine. You know, you need to like let it go. Like this whole like validation process. You know, only if you get in, you are something or whatever. At the end of the day, you are human, and you. You know, you're not a, I don't know, an animal or whatever, or like, you, you don't get declassified by not being there, you know. At the end of the day, it's all about uh, FOMO there, and being part of it is nice, but not being part of there is also nice, you know. Don't be a cloud chaser. Try to evolve like an in individual. That's also the, th also the thing to the all new people arriving here. Over identifying, we had like a reaction from Arte, over identifying with the scene and basing their their whole image around it, you know, being bear kind, you know, they're starting to dress uh, in day night with this Doc Martens plateau shoes, leather, leather uh, jacket or whatever, this leather, yeah, leather trench coat or whatever, you know, looking like goth, emo, kind of uh, techno 
techno fashion and over identifying with it even though like last year or like a few months ago there were like colorful hispanic uh, people being here eating whatever drinking tequila and mezcal and whatever and uh, eating tacos not to be racist but i mean like being like whole in their culture well, everybody we can you can replace it to anybody's culture you know like being like super super not techno and then they kind of lay it off to just unify with the rest here we're talking about we have times of indivi individuality and stuff but it it's not it couldn't be more far away from it everybody is trying to reach to an, one equilibrium where they become one stylistically and uh ideology wise and um and i would just tell myself like okay you know act act casual i i practice you know i spoke enough german pretty quickly that i learned how to answer simple questions because they'd ask you like the odd bist du how old are you and i would say like five and whatever 22. um sometimes they'd ask like who you were there to see like so i would memorize at least one person who was like djing that night um and i even had this like never, never heard these questions to be honest Never heard this question in Berghain, but this this was like a question from 2018-17, I think, uh, in any other club. They really wanted to know you who is playing on the lineup back then. Nowadays, they don't ask these questions because I think they kind of know that nobody knows or that everybody knows that they're gonna ask this question and they already prepared themselves, you know. So there is like this whole thing, you know, they kind of educated everybody to look at the lineup, I guess. Or not? What's your opinion about it? Like, the, I, I told myself if I was ever rejected, I'd give them this answer, which is like, "Aber ich bin die Hausfrau." Like, but I'm the but I'm the woman of the house tonight, or I'm the I'm the housewife. Which like I never had to say that, but you know, I was so scared. I, I did whatever I could to like prepare mentally. <laughs> so if you got rejected, he said, "I'm the housewife." Why? <laughs> Like, I belong there, <laughs> okay? Or you, you just want to clean up there? Or what does it mean, you... <laughs> okay. For the possibility that I would be challenged. So what's the door selection process like? So you get to the front, and they usually kind of wave a hand, like, okay, wait. And so you're just standing there and waiting. And yeah. like, um, I couldn't even... That's like, f literally psychological uh, torture. <laughs> this shit. Tell which of the guards was making the selection. Apparently only some of them are allowed to select or yeah. reject. But it's all happening through, like very subtle eye contact cues and your job when you're standing there is just to like stand there and play it cool and like i would just be like don't do anything just stand there and look at them and just be really open and like try to project a sense of like confidence um but inside i was terrified every single time and then when i get inside the shakes would be like you know kind of subsiding and then that was what powered me to like then go into the bathrooms to like try to find somebody to hang out with or try to find some illicit substances or whatever. It was like that anxiety turned into like exhilaration. Um, this I don't know. I would say after you pass it, you know, this whole selection process, you just feel a bit like more relieved, I think. <laughs> but it is, it's not like you have to immediately go to the toilet to just like chill a bit. <laughs> the third thing that I want to say is that my life was very dangerous. And I don't mean in terms of violence necessarily, I mean in terms of the types of decisions people were making with their bodies. I had one friend who had a seizure at the club, um, and then she was so terrified that like authorities would be notified that she refused to get help and, um, and none of us knew what to do. I've seen people completely collapse and go unconscious. I've seen people engaging in sex acts where it seemed like it, possibly they weren't fully conscious themselves. It was a really scary place for me. Maybe not for everybody, but for me. You know, I myself... It's not scary, but definitely it's not for... Uh, what's the English word? Light-hearted people? <laughs> for, for not tough people? For thin-skinned people? Um, yeah, there's definitely, I heard a lot of these stories, actually, that unconscious people are getting there, um, which is super dark. And at the end of the day, we talk about it, like, as a safe space. Uh, the clubs is a safe space. From my perception of it is always actually Wild West, more like anarchy type. And the beautiful thing about this anarchy in my eyes is that it, like, self the self-organization of this anarchy 
create something beautiful, right? Because everybody has like this concept of how to behave to each other. Let's say like more, more kind, you know, it's like self-organizing and feels like utopia in a way. Everybody's do everybody is doing what he, what it wants. Okay. And nobody judges it, judges you for doing it. Okay. But you know, if there is a snake in heaven, it will turn to hell. <laughs> That's like my free free uh, reinterpretation of Bible uh, Bible, but yeah, if there are like people that are like uh, meant or like willing to do sexual harassment acts, you know, spiking and whatever, this is also the place to do it because it's all anarchy at the end of the day, you know. And then you know, and then you have the problem, you know, that you know you need to kind of you know uh, narrow down the freedomness there. And this is like a whole paradox or dilemma, you know? So tell me what's your opinion about it. <laughs> Self mixed uppers and downers and all sorts of different substances that are like potentially lethal to mix, you know? And I flirted with the edge. There was one night, it wasn't at bad kind, but there was one night when like I had mixed some things that I remember soon after I realized I shouldn't have mixed those things and I was afraid that I wasn't, that I was gonna lose consciousness. One of the scariest drugs that was around me and that you know i definitely partook in was ghb which you know he said the magical the the cursed g word ghb yeah that's something really dangerous be careful with that stuff oh it creates this sense of euphoria and the sense of physical charge people use it in a sexual context a lot we're talking in terms of like milliliters in a pipette and just a little too much could be enough to kill you or could be enough to make you unconscious so that you die from some other reason. Um, and then mix- Like swallowing your tongue and stuff, you know? Mixing with alcohol is even more dangerous. Uh, and people, myself included, were doing that all the time. Not even keeping track, just mixing whatever. You know, we'd file into the bathroom and then the bathrooms were this whole like, you know, in Mean Girls, when they go through the cafeteria and show you all the different crews, like in the bathrooms in Bad Kind, they were always packed to the brim, so packed that you couldn't even like find a space to stand. And uh, there was this kind of hierarchy where like people who thought they were cool would sort of cut in line and be like, this is my stall. I remember there's this one guy who was like a deal. I don't know. Never seen this. Maybe I am myself like this. I don't know. But uh, yeah, you know, since everybody, I don't know. I just, I don't know if I can say this anyway. And he was a sort of ballet dancer and he would like, when a door, when a bathroom door would open, he'd throw his leg up and block anybody else from going in with a leg like up above people's heads and be like, it's mine, bitch. Uh, so that was the culture inside. And then, you know, you're if you're lucky enough to like get a spot in line and get into the bathroom, eight people file in with you. You're packed to the brim with all these people and you know, drugs are coming out and maybe people are sharing or maybe not, or maybe it's two different groups and you're- But this secret is there, you know, be just open about it. And if you don't, I mean, just be open to people, you know, if you're like waiting for bathrooms and stuff, you know, just reach out to somebody who is in the first line there with his group and say, hey, can I join you? You know, usually they say yes. And that's why eight people are in one bath. Uh, to, maybe they are separate uh, friend groups, but you know, you just need to kind of socialize also with people. I think, you know, you don't have to be like so much loaded with anxiety and stuff. Each doing your own substances or whatever. And like people would pass around the GHB pipette and like GHB burns your mouth. So we would like hold a little bit of soda in our mouth and squeeze it in and then swallow it all together so that we didn't burn our yeah, mouth. This shit is like the first, I, like the first times I was raving, it was always at Watergate, Watergate and i don't know like 17 or something and first time seeing it was like what the fuck is happening there you know you're just passing the toilets somebody opens up the toilets you see you see people standing like here on the ground here's the toilet here's somebody staying upright on top somebody's staying even higher and they're dropping like with this uh, pipettes what he said like something and you're like what the fuck is happening here what, what, what is it i don't even get it you know Back then, I didn't know what it is, where it is, and what they are doing, you know? But you see, like, fucking eight people towering up in the toilet. And you're like, what the fuck is this? Is this, like, a sex act or something? And at the end, it was, like, the G usage. 
burn our throats on the way down. You know, you would see these like 18, 19 year olds taking these huge amounts of GHB. And it was just like, oh my God, this is really flirting with the edge. I hope I've communicated a little bit of the fear, anxiety, and excitement that all mixed together and created this culture of like, oh my God, I have to spend every weekend there. I have lots more stories to tell about Bad Kind. If you wanna know more, let me know in the comments. Tell me what you wanna hear. I can tell you about DJ sets. I can tell you about the architecture. I can tell you about more of the interpersonal culture. I can tell you about the lights, the situation with the lights DJ. I mean, there were so many amazing, epic things about the design of that space that for me were unfortunately undermined by the fact that it was actually like a really negative interpersonal experience for me, which I only realized years after the fact. And I've been back since, I've been back sober a couple of times and it was fun, you know, it was fine. But after about half an hour, I had had enough. Whereas back when I used to go there as a kind of addict, I would spend eight to 12 hours there reliably, sometimes more, sometimes 20 hours. Uh, people would compete for like how long they could stay. It was very strange. If you want more videos like this, yeah, you as an addict, you never get enough of it. But I would say as well, man, <clears throat> I just I just like to be like like four hours, four hours or three hours is I think the perfect edge. You know, you can listen to one DJ set or half of one DJ set, another half. If it's good, you dance. If not, not, and then you leave. Because I don't like to be like uh, a fucking hangover anymore. So that's why you need like to, <laughs> you need to kind of way what's more important to you you know show that you're raving more or just being being in good shape you know and if you're like flirting with the edge like he said you're usually not in a good shape anytime you're always from one hangover to another hangover and that's like a thing in berlin that's pretty present it's pretty present you see it in the people and they don't see it themselves they say they don't have hangovers or whatever you know but be like that it's all pretty pretentious uh but as he said he only lighted the negative uh, negative uh, things uh, of, of this whole pair kind of thing there's a lot of uh, beautiful thing as the djs the light the architecture and whatever so it's still like uh the best best thing to do in turn in party wise but uh yeah these three ugly things are definitely definitely there definitely true and it's i think just a thing like how you how you deal with it you know you don't have to be like super anxiety overloaded by it but you know the perception of things is always different from different people you know nobody has like the same perception of reality that's why it's all a perspective thing and we can start all the spirituality stuff but we <laughs> we leave it for today and let's see what what in the comment what are the comments i always thought the whole point of the scene was to reject traditional club culture turns out in a lot of regular clubs culture yep true that's what uh yeah a lot of people in berlin kind of make going to berkheim their whole personality yes i've seen a lot of examples of this and not just berkheim i guess there are similar things with kitkat although too cool for school q mystique is not the same there but i can totally see how getting rejected can be a blow to someone's ego and actually in the scene they're talking about i resolved my ego in the last uh, g session <laughs> And it's all about just ego things, you know. It's like also in spirituality, I think you, the way you think your ego is, uh, you killed your ego is actually the biggest sign that you have still the ego because you just don't want to admit that you can get over it, you know. And that's why you're lying to yourself. Uh, I've been a few times in a, and rejected a few times. The parties are great and once you're in, you feel like a million bucks. But someone who goes only for techno, they're... There's only some policy which uh, if a DJ plays there, he cannot place any, anywhere else in Berlin for a few months, okay? It is annoying as hell to queue up for hours in winter to be rejected. I would much prefer if it if they could find a more human way to reject in those situation. But I guess that wouldn't be cool. Yeah, so true. Ah, yeah, but you have to uh, keep the mystique uh, upright, right? So it's still like the most coolest place, I guess. And if we Google the top clubs worldwide, is Berkheim still on the list with DJ Mac? Let's see if Berkheim is in the top 10. Echo Stage, Ushi, Ibiza, Boathouse. It's funny that Boathouse is number five. It's I think it's in Cologne and it's over Berkheim. Crazy. And Berkheim is number 13, but 13 is a good number. I wonder like how this... Uh, <laughs> 
how this uh, ranking is made, but it's funny that Becca is number 13. 13, my, my most, my favorite number. And need to check out both house, I guess. Yeah, so I think there's a reason, like, they're doing it, and that's why they're still in the rankings of the top clubs, basically, you know. And I think that's a, that's an essential part. Besides their uh, crazy architecture and crazy uh, artsy uh, stuff behind them. Do you have something to add what is an ugly truth about partying scene? Maybe about Berghain, if you've been there. And share it in the comments. Or what? What is your opinion? You know, do you think as is like as a as a contradiction all the stuff that he said with the with the techno scene where it's about peace, love, and harmony, and at the end it's like so violent in there and uh, and in front of the door there. You know, you don't feel like welcomed on stuff. You just feel like inferior, and only if you get in you feel welcomed, which is a uh, maybe it's a nice humbling process. I don't know, but maybe it's not not useful, especially if you, like him, you know, if he's a regular basically, and he knows what's uh, what's go what's happening there, right? Why does he has to be? Why does he has to fear to be rejected? You know, if he's a regular, an obvious regular. I can understand if like people that are displaced there get rejected, like so the the drunk English guys or whatever, or like anybody who is like conservative and you see it in their eyes or like drunk behavior or whatever okay but if you kind of belong there visually i don't see a point why you why you need to be rejected otherwise then you want to really save them from themselves protect them from themselves but yeah so tell me if you uh, what's your opinion about it? is it a contradiction to the whole techno culture and especially the behavior of toxic people inside the club scene is also like a thing that we can talk about and like the ballet dude who's like crossing with his leg and saying that's that's my cabin bitch is is funny but it's something that wouldn't wonder me happening didn't see it yet haven't seen it yet but <laughs> could happen. So, sounds super realistically, sounds super backhand. And I think I would just laugh it off, to be honest. But still, it's toxic. It, it feels like there's some royalties there who feel like they are more capable to do than others. And the one they're uh, like a bit humbled. And there are a lot of people they don't care about this politics at all. And that's the most beautiful thing about it. So with that being said, <laughs> I just want to end this video. Uh, enough of me talking about backhand um so yeah tell me your opinion uh, i just want to know if you see the, these ugly truth as a contradiction to this whole uh, ideology of techno and with that being said see you in the next video like share and subscribe